listen to our webinar on, on inflation dynamics and its effect on global businesses. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Peter Gibbon, and I'm the manager of uh, market research and analytics here at World Trade Center Utah. If you are not familiar with our organization, we are a member of the broader World Trade Center Association, which encompasses over 300 other members, representing over 90 countries across the globe. Our mission here at WTC Utah is to accelerate growth for Utah companies through our networks, our services, and our programs. Today, our discussion revolves, revolves around the trepidation associated with increased levels of inflation. And inflation and the metrics that measure it have been discussed quite frequently in the news lately, with the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Labor Department paying close attention to key indicators to measure such inflation. We will be discussing what causes this inflation, the key indicators that are being monitored, and how businesses can be proactive and reactive to these inflation concerns. Before beginning, we would like to extend a special thank you to the Salt Lake Chamber of Commerce for partnering with us on this event, as well as our continued support from our member organizations. We are joined today with our distinguished uh, speakers, Troy Keller, Robert Spenlove, and David Bauman. Thank you all for participating in this discussion. Troy Keller will be moderating, moderating our discussion today. Troy Keller is a partner at Dorsey and Whitney here in Salt Lake City. He is also the trade policy advisor at World Trade Center Utah. Before joining Dorsey, Troy was vice president of corporate law and global government relations at the Huntsman Corporation. Previous to Huntsman, he was a securities and M&A counsel at Quest Communications, and he began his career as an attorney at the New York office of Sidley, Sidley Austin. Troy is a frequent commentator in business and media publications here in Utah. Additionally, he is admitted to practice law in New York, Colorado, and Utah. Troy has over 25 years of experience in mergers and acquisitions, international joint ventures, corporate governance, and government relations. Thank you, Troy. Additionally, we have Robert Spendlove uh, here with us today. Robert is a senior vice president and economic and public policy advisor officer, excuse me, for Zion's Bank. In his in this capacity, he monitors and, re and reports on economic indicators and public policy developments for the bank. Zion's was founded in 1873 and is Utah's oldest financial institution and it operates locations and communities throughout the Intermountain West. Robert's research interests are primarily in the areas of macroeconomics, demographics, financial markets, and public policy. He frequently advises and briefs policymakers, as well as businesses and civic groups throughout the United States. He is also regularly called on to give expert analysis in the media, print, radio, and television. Robert is known for his insightful and understandable approach to explaining economic trends. Thank you, Robert. Additionally, we have David Bauman, Director of, Director of Transaction Management at CBRE here in Salt Lake City. He is also the Director of Global Advisory uh, with CBRE. David oversees the global client relations, develops transaction management strategies for global clients, directs business development, manages the Salt Lake City-based team of transaction managers serving clients occupying real estate throughout the globe. David started his career in corporate real estate in 2006 and has managed many global accounts for public, private, and nonprofit companies. Prior to joining CBRE, David served as Director of Global Corporate Services in Newark, Grubb, Knight, Frank, Salt Lake City office. David currently sits on leadership boards within, the, within WTC Utah and the Utah chapter of CoreNet Global. Additionally, he is an adjunct professor uh, for U of U's Master of Real Estate Development program. David holds a bachelor's degree in finance and an MBA, both from the University of Utah. Thank you all for joining us today. Troy, I hand it off to you now. Great, Peter, thanks so much. Thanks for the introduction and for putting together this, uh, this, this great group. Um, I'm excited to, to hear from David and, and, and Robert. Uh, they're, they're so embedded in the community uh, and have, and have uh, expertise that I think is gonna make today's discussion really interesting and really fun. And, and, and I think uh, even sort of 
useful from a directional basis as we try to you know pull together information on what we can do for our state uh given what clearly continue to be trying times um the question one of the big questions for today is 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 inflation uh one of the big issues we need to deal with it may seem like a dumb question um i mean you know, a lot of us remember the 70s when inflation was the issue and now i think people are seeing it rise again but aren't sure what to make of it and um, we we see spikes in certain areas you know, what is, does this mean the world that it's going to be the issue again, or will it come and go? And so I think those are some of the things we'll, we'll tackle today. To get us started, we're going to um, ask uh, Robert to um, to give us some 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 background on on inflation itself, what causes it, and just to tee that up. And I hope he's okay with this. I am going to read from. So I've got I've got a set of encyclopedias that I got, you know, in the '90s when I when, when I was married when I first got married. And I wanted something good to sit, look at to look at in my bookshelf, and these were cheap. And uh, it was a set from the '40s. Uh, but every once in a while, they're a bit like a time machine. If I want to go back and see how people thought in the '40s, I open these up, and it's pretty interesting. So here's here's what they say about inflation. It says uh, inflation is usually caused by war activities, which sacrifice the production of normal peacetime consumers and producers' goods in favor of arms and military equipment. And I thought, huh. That is really interesting. That's what usually causes inflation. Um, Robert, what uh, you didn't have to respond to that or not, but but in your mind, what you know, frame it for us. What is you know the macro level? What what is causing inflation uh, today, and what are some of the you know drivers behind it? Thanks, Troy. <clears throat> and I think that's a, actually a great analogy um, because we are in a lot of ways. Uh, in a, a state of war right now. And it's the war uh, against the coronavirus. And that is one of the big driving factors of the inflation that we're seeing right now. Um, so if you kind of break it down into its ba basic components, you know, what is inflation? It's essentially describing uh, the uh, process of price increases. And so, you know, we, uh, when we have price increases, they can go up and they can go down. But uh, if those price increases continue and they build on each other, that creates inflation. So why do we have that? Well, if you just kind of think about your econ 101, uh, you've got kind of two sides. You've got supply and demand. Uh, on the uh, demand side, you've got consumers. Consumers are the largest portion of the economy. They make up about two thirds of the economy. So if, if you've got uh, high consumer demand, uh, you can see that that uh, impetus for prices to go up. Then on the other side is supply. Uh, and again, uh, if we've got uh, what we're seeing right now is a reduction in supply because of supply chain breakdowns. So we've got higher consumer demand. Uh, well, let's jump back about a year. Um, so when when the pandemic first hit, you know, we all remember when we were all sent home. And uh, you know everyone stayed in their houses. We had the stay-at-home orders. Think about what that does to consumer demand. Consumer demand essentially just uh, evaporated overnight, uh, and then that those uh, those restrictions continued really until the beginning of 2021. Um, and so uh, in 2020, 2021, consumers started to come back in. Consumer demand really spiked. Everyone wanted to get back outside. Everyone wanted to go on vacation or, uh, you know, uh, move or just re-engage with the world. So there was a high level of consumer demand. But then on the other side, again, because of the pandemic, we had we have these breakdowns in our supply chains, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, domestically or uh, from foreign sources. And we continue to see those today. Uh, you know, an example of that is the chip shortage. Uh, so, you know, essentially there's one main uh, chip producer in the world, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, and they just haven't been able to keep up with the demand for chips that exist. So what does that do? Well, the first thing it did was it impacted uh, new cars. And so we saw the price of new cars go way up because everyone wanted a new car. Um, but then uh, it also impacted the prices of used cars. And we saw uh, used car prices spike. Um, and then you kind of go over to the, the rental car market. Uh, rental car companies last year saw consumer demand essentially evaporate. So they sold off their fleets. 
And then when that consumer demand came back, they tried, they wanted to buy up uh, cars again, but they weren't available anymore. So that's where you saw rental prices go up. So, uh, so we've got all these different dynamics going on simultaneously. Then let me just add one other thing. Then you add to that uh, the uh, inter or government policies, uh, especially at the federal government level. So you've got fiscal policy and monetary policy. Fiscal policy meaning uh, the Congress uh, has been spending dramatically over the last year, $4.6 trillion on all the different aid packages uh, related to, to the uh, coronavirus pandemic. So you've got this injection of money from Congress. And then on the monetary policy side, you've got the Fed with very accommodative uh, monetary policies where they've uh, dropped interest rates uh, or the federal funds rate to zero, which really moves all the interest rates down. And then they're bond buying. Uh, the Fed's balance sheet has gone from $4 trillion uh, at the beginning of last year, so uh, in 20, uh, beginning of 2020, to today it's at $8 trillion. So they've doubled the size of their balance sheet. They're essentially creating $120 billion of uh, 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 every month out of thin air. And so all that is kind of coming together and creating these inflationary pressures. That is fascinating. So in other words, there's a ton of money in the system, but, but and at the same time, goods are hard to get. And so it, it drives price. Yeah, on, on, the auto, on the automobiles, uh, never mind, I, I had this really strange, which sort of is maybe a good anecdote for how strange the world is right now. A few months ago, we went in to buy a, buy a new car and they said, well, you're gonna have to wait. And we said, okay, that's fine. So they put us on waiting list. They called us back a week later. And they said, hey, you know, we just got a used car and it's a year old. It's exactly what you wanted. Um, doesn't have all the up, upgrades, but it's pretty much exactly what you wanted. And I said, oh, that sounds great. What's, what's the price? And they quoted me a price that was more, it's $2,000 more than the new car. And I said, well, why would I do that? And they said, they said, oh, Mr. Keller, get, get real. This is the world we live in, you know? <laughs> and, that, I, I, and it was, it was bizarre, but it's doing funny things to prices right now. Actually, that's exactly right. Uh, David, um, any, th I mean, I know, you know, while we're talking about quantitative easing and the amount of money in the system and, and you're very tied in, I know, to the real estate market, but the financial uh, sector generally in Utah, any, any, anything that you're seeing on this front that kind of shows uh, maybe how these, these forces are impacting the Utah, the Utah market in particular? Sure. Well, I, I think Robert is, is accurately stating the, the fact that um, a lot of these trends are exacerbated by the drop off uh, of activity immediately um, at the outset of COVID. And so really you know, something that we would call base effects where the benchmark is artificially low because pricing went down first. And so, you know, airfare has been, been mentioned. You know, if you take airfare, for example, airfare you, you, on the latest CPI is up 19% um, year over year, but compared to December of 2019, which is right before COVID, it's actually down 6%. And so we might see that huge increase in, in inflation, which is real and which hurts uh, the consumer but we have to keep it in perspective that 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 because of base effects that benchmark is is lower than it would have been so so speaking you know, same th same thing could be said of rental cars as, as robert already mentioned you know in, in real estate we see that um a lot you know lumber is another obvious example of of where um an immediate shock to the the supply and and also demand from from covid sees itself play out over time. Um, so COVID related, folks in concrete jungle cities looking to spend more time in suburban cities and remodel their homes uh, since they're spending more time at home. Now we all in Utah have seen this big time as we've seen an influx of, of in migration into the state from people I have, I'm sure all of us on the call have family members or friends that have moved in from Seattle or San Francisco or Los Angeles or the East Coast. And so not only have they moved here, but they've spent more time remodeling their homes uh, since they're spending more time at home. So that's, that caused an immediate impact in lumber, 
And then that, that has a trickle through effect to real estate pricing and to home pricing. It's just one factor of increases in home, in home pricing. But, but I really think that these spending patterns will continue to shift and there will be these continuous waves of how it actually reverberates through the system. So lumber we're seeing coming down because I think people are getting into the summer months or have it in the summer months. And instead of doing remodeling projects, they finally wanted to go and have a trip, have a vacation. And so that's why we see the impact on airfare prices that we, that we did. I, I think over time, these base effects uh, will smooth out. I think um, we've probably already seen kind of the, the high of inflation. And, um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about, you know, real, specific real estate impacts. But, but I think all these things are, are transitory um, as opposed to, to permanent or long-term issues. That is great to hear. Um, uh, what one uh, and for for the for the listeners on the call, and I apologize if I uh, I can't remember if we said this before or not. But if you have comments or questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the in the chat box, and uh, and we'll uh, and we'll we'll try to address those uh, throughout the call or at the end as time permits. Um, so David and Robert, uh, a lot of businesses here in Utah are, are impacted by the cost of getting, getting goods here that they either use as components or commodities. I know David, you talked about, about lumber just now. Um, are there other areas or uh, that, that have you worried in terms of, uh, of inflationary spikes on, or, the, or if not specific areas, just generally on getting the raw materials that people in Utah manufacturers, for example, <clears throat> need in order to uh, in order to make their goods and conduct their business. Yeah, I thought David David had a great point about lumber. Um, you know, and, and the problem with commodity prices is we really uh, have no control. You know, it, it's always a question of substitutes. Can you substitute something you know for a, a, another uh, good? And often you can't, um, you know, with, with home building, you can't, I guess you could substitute lumber with steel, but, um, you know, which also steel prices have been way up too. Um, but I, and I just, I pulled up that, that chart real quick of the lumber prices. So, but it, it's a great example though. It went from $500 a board foot a year ago to $1,500 a board foot in May, but where is it today? It's back down to $500. So, you know, would you call that inflationary? I don't think it is. Um, you know, it, it, it was a price increase that then went away. Um, but then on the other side, uh, you look at gas prices. Uh, gas prices, you know, essentially collapsed uh, in the spring of last year. There was a, a, a small period of just a few days where the uh, price per barrel of oil was negative. It was negative $80 a barrel. So you had to pay someone to take that oil off your hands because there was so little demand. Well, what's happened in the year since, uh, now we're seeing uh, gas prices in the last year are up 42%. Now, uh, you know, just like David said, a lot of that is because that base effect, because the demand was so low a year ago uh, that we're seeing these big increases. But the, but the uh, in terms of the... Uh, the, the future trend, um, I, I do have some concerns that we will see some more permanent uh, increases that, that some of these prices will stick around. Um, and I, I think we'll get to that in a minute. The reason for that is because of uh, wage inflation. Uh, but so there is, uh, you know, the, and this is the biggest argument going on right now with the Fed is whether this inflation is temporary or transitory or whether it's going to be uh, more permanent. And it's, you know, there's kind of signs on each side, but it is getting difficult. What, one other kind of example, um, in terms of getting those commodities uh, to the US, we've seen huge increases in, uh, in shipping costs. Uh, I, I, I had a friend tell me recently that a shipping container uh, a year ago cost about $2,000 to bring to the US. It's now $10,000. Um, and then you hear about China shutting down many of their ports because of the uh, coronavirus. Vietnam, 
is uh, now going through, uh, uh, is really struggling because of a current surge. Uh, I just read about that this morning. So these, uh, these supply chain breakdowns eventually will work themselves out. But, you know, if it takes two or three years, then it could uh, cause that those price increases to be more sticky and to, to remain. I would just I would just also mention um, I agree with you, Robert. Um, I I hear I heard driving in today an interesting uh, piece from the Wall the Wall Street Journal about uh, diapers increases in price in diapers, and that's because so much of the raw material that, that is put into all the different materials is is lumber based, um, and so those commodities you know, even in, in, in products that you might not think of will have um, impacts on pricing. In, in the case of diapers, as the Wall Street Journal was saying, you know, there's also consolidation in the industry. And so 80% of the diapers are manufactured by two, by, by two, um, two companies. And so I think we'll see it there. Lumber is certainly the, the, the big one. Um, if I think back probably, oh, uh, four or five months ago, I was talking with one of our construction project managers who was having an, a really difficult time getting steel stud framing for office um, tenant improvements. And it was akin to toilet paper shortages that all of us stressed out about in our homes. I think there was a there was kind of a run and, and, and as the, many of the contractors here, perhaps on this call know, um, those that had the means uh, and a place to store it were stockpiling steel frames. And, and that made it very difficult for the just-in-time uh, contractors to be able to get the materials they need to, to stay in a budget. Again, I think that is another example of a, a very you know, temporary, perhaps longer than we're all comfortable with, but something that will, uh, will solve itself over time. Um, and since this is World Trade Center, I think it's, it's important for people to know the good work that WTC Utah is doing in this regard, especially related to the importing of, of, um, of materials in container ships. On a call a week or so ago, I learned that there were 26 container ships sitting outside of Long Beach port that could not come into harbor, 26. And, and so then it becomes a matter of who, is, who gets priority and, and what businesses can actually get their goods in and how fast can it be processed. And so as you can think about ways in which our state can help there, I think um, the World Trade Center is putting together a coalition of, of company manufacturers and retailers that are hoping to, to appeal to, to a national level to try to solve this issue, especially around the prioritization of, of goods coming in. The Inland Port, obviously another important aspect that's policy and business uh, related that will help in the long term. David, I'm, thank you so much for for bringing those those initiatives to uh, to the attention of the group here, because that is uh, those those are major initiatives that the World Trade Center is working on. Um, if there are people on this call and your company is not currently part of that coalition, it's open to anyone who who you know who wants to participate. Participation involves just a little bit of time and and maybe some sharing of info and and uh, finding ways in which we can make sure that. Utah companies are able to get the goods they need to and are able to export the goods they need in order to conduct their business. So pre appreciate that plug. Um, uh, okay, let's uh, let's move to uh, let's move to wages because I, you know, if, when I talk to companies in town, um, they're worried about you know def, you know certainly the, the lumber issues, the you know, travel costs, or a lot of things they're focused on and worried about. But wages seems to be across the board the most you know the most um, most important concern they have in terms of inflation. And again, just to throw out another quick anecdote there, like my 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 law firm, you know, we just we just gave raises across the board to associates you know, across the firm, but including in Salt Lake, um, and and that was just because uh, because even though our market might feel you know, used to be that the Salt Lake market was, you know, kind of distinct from the rest of the country. That's just not the case anymore. And you, you know, people, you know, people here can can work, uh, especially in the professional services and technology, can work for a company anywhere. 
And uh, so market forces are driving up inflation, but of course the government spending might, has a role to play there too. And so people are worried um, that like, employers are worried, like how do we, you know, how do we manage that and without gouging our customers to, to make up for the, the increased costs that we have? And, and are those wages going to, as I know I'm throwing a lot of questions at you guys, but are the wages going to stick? Is that going to be what the future is? Will they continue to rise? Is it possible for wages to come back down when some of these other pressures come back down? Seems unlikely to me, but, but who knows? So those are, I think those are, you know, those are some, some tough questions, but I know are important to, to, to employers. So um, I don't know, Robert, do we, should, we, should we start with you and get any thoughts you have on that? Sure. And I can just kind of give a little bit of uh, economic background on that. Um, if you think about it, uh, what we're seeing is another supply chain breakdown. So when we think of supply chains, we generally think about those goods, but those people are part of that supply chain. And uh, just to give you a, a little bit of perspective. So in the latest jobs report, the national jobs report, uh, we find that uh, we still have 5.6 million fewer people working today than before the pandemic. That's where uh, the Federal Reserve is really focusing. They're saying, okay, we're not back. We don't have everyone back to work yet. And so we need to continue with this very accommodative monetary policy. However, so we're at 5.6 million fewer jobs. However, right now, there are more than 10 million job openings in America. So we've got 10 million jobs and only uh, uh, 5.6 uh, million fewer uh, people. So what, what we've got is we've just got this huge demand uh, for jobs. We've got a, a, a labor shortage. Um, and then if you dig just one level deeper, you really start to understand it when you look at the labor force participation rate, which is the percent of the population that's working or looking for a job. And what we've seen there is the labor force participation rate dropped dramatically uh, going into the, the pandemic. And even with the, the much lower unemployment rate, it hasn't recovered to where it was before the pandemic. Even in Utah, the labor force participation rate in Utah today is lower than it was pre-pandemic. So what that means is many people have completely just walked away from the labor market. They've retired or they've uh, you know, maybe gone to school or maybe they just don't wanna work anymore. And, you know, and so we don't have the ability to produce as much or uh, to, to have as much labor as we did uh, two years ago. So the result of that is we're seeing uh, this labor shortage is causing wage pressure. In the last jobs report, the wage growth, growth was 4%. And just like you said, Troy, uh, wage inflation is very sticky. Uh, it's very difficult. Just, you know, you think about it as an employer. Um, you know, you, if you bring in someone, if you go from $13 an hour to $15 an hour, you're not going to later cut their pay back down to $13 an hour. In fact, what's going to happen is that all their other coworkers are going to hear what happened and you're going to have to raise all their wages to $15 an hour. And so what, what wage inflation does is it locks in uh, other inflationary uh, increases. And so that, that is one of the things that I'm concerned about when we've got such a big labor shortage and we're seeing those, uh, those wage pressures that it, uh, and this is what we saw in the 1970s is it becomes this spiral of wage uh, increases chasing inflationary increases. So it's great for the individual when you see that, those wage increases, but not good for the overall economy. Robert, um, a question just came in that I think is a question to, to, what, to what you just said. It says, uh, this is from Jonathan Bench. I read yesterday about an unanticipated number of people retiring. Any idea which parts of the country and which sectors will feel that most? Obviously, in Utah, we're one of the few states that, well, maybe not even not anymore, but has has had population growth, um, maybe more for, through in migration. You know, so I guess I'll let him, you can answer that question directly, but I'd love to add, add kind of a Utah spin on it. What in Utah? How do we, you know, how do we, how do we see that playing out? No, that's absolutely true. And you know, I, I wish I had my graph right now. You know, I'm I'm, I'm a graph guy, but uh, so that if you break down labor force participation into age groups, it's really interesting. So I broke it down into three major age groups: teenagers, uh, your prime age uh, labor participation, which is 25 to 54, and then 55 and older. And uh, what you see is with teenage labor participation, it's actually back up. It has recovered. 
So, uh, so we're good there. Teenagers are back in the, in the labor force. That prime age uh, looks very similar to the overall labor participation, which is it's about halfway back to where it was before, but it's uh, trending up. It's that uh, older age, the, so the 55 and older labor participation, not only is it down, but it's trending down. So even as the economy is improving, we're losing more people to retirement. Um, and you know, it, 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 it's a combination of factors. There's still a lot of fear of the virus, especially uh, with the Delta variant going through. And then that co combined with a really strong uh, stock market, people have you know, good retirement savings, which is great to see, but we are losing uh, uh, those uh, retirees at younger ages. And it is, I would say it's hitting nationwide, but it also is hitting in Utah. Um, and the biggest struggle from a policy standpoint is how do you pull these people back into the labor market? It's, it's gonna be really difficult to convince a retiree to come back into the labor market. David, uh, what, uh, what, do you, what, what do you, what do you think, what do you think about, about all that? I know you're, you know, you're helping a lot of Utah companies figure out where they're, where they're going to be and how they're going to get to Utah and grow in Utah. Um, do you see this, you know, the wages and, and, and the workforce as being, as being a, a major challenge? I think that it is a challenge. I, I think that Utah still offers so many other benefits that, and, and we've been so competitive for so long in many of these aspects that I, I still think Utah will be an attractive place for businesses to operate in, especially um, in light of, you know, you look at the, the things we've seen in the last 12 months, we've seen COVID, which has impacted densely populated cities, public transportation, um, and just quality of life, air quality, those things. Now we have our own air quality problem, um, but, but I think Utah still will attract people. And if you look at speaking specifically of the workers in Utah, and Robert would know these numbers better than I would, and maybe he, he has the numbers, but I think Utah's uh, median age of worker is, has increased uh, a little bit lately because of perhaps a decline in birth, birth rate, but also because of immigration of, of, of highly skilled workers that are entering our state. And so from a non-economist point of view is, is retirees, you know, phase out of the workforce and you replace at least a portion of them with um, uh, a more diverse uh, labor pool, that, that I think could be a real benefit to our state over time. I also think that from a, a policy standpoint, um, we have to do well in our state and making sure that there aren't labor shortages in particular industries. And the way we can do that is largely through education so that we're not creating skill gaps. Um, and so that we're attracting talent to the state is one, but also you know, using good STEM program, for example, to, to um, produce young workers in industries that, that we um, need to, to make sure are are filled well. Um, and this question just came through about you know what policies would 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 we recommend to, to mitigate the pressures and and David I think your answer was was spot on in terms of the need you know to, the state can help people reskill and we have a policymaker on here with Representative Spenlove and and what what um uh, anything else to, in response to that question maybe with, with I mean I don't know people I hear people say there's there's a lot of workforce in rural Utah. We just need to find a way to tap into it. I, um, any other thoughts on on policies that the state could do? Yeah, I agree. I think one of our top priorities needs to be this idea of workforce alignment. You know, where we're educating our kids to to be ready for the jobs that are in demand. And so, uh, and, and that may not be, you know, it certainly could be college, but it also could be a, a technical training. Or apprenticeships. I mean, there's, but we we've got to do a better job of identifying uh, uh, kids' skill sets and and adult skill sets and connecting them with the needs of uh, of employers. And then with the um, uh, with the rural Utah, that is, uh, I think one of the big solutions for that, and uh, uh, we might get to that, is infrastructure inv investment, especially uh, broadband. Rather than trying to bring them all to the Wasatch Front. 
what we want to be able to do is grow their communities where they are. Um, that's that's perfect. Well, let's uh, let's let's then pivot to infrastructure spending. Uh, since you mentioned it, it is I have found it to be highly to be something that's obviously highly controversial um, at the at the federal level. I think Utah seems to. I think we can pat ourselves on the back. We, you know, we with the infrastructure spending that we do, people seem to be pretty, pretty, you know, pretty glad to be to see where where it goes. And um, uh, but uh, at the federal level, a lot of controversy over whether it makes sense. And one of the one of the concerns people raise is the fact that inflation that it could cause inflation, all that spending. Um, now I know there's uh, an economist uh, perspective that. Well, if you do the spending right, it's just going. What what it will do in the long term is make things more efficient because you've got, you know, people can get goods through better roads uh, more and more and more quickly. So it'll lower the cost of goods, et cetera. Um, so uh, so you know, to tee up that highly controversial question, which you're free to jump into. Uh, in fact, if you want to jump into it from a political standpoint, be my guest, uh, or just or or just at the ivory tower would be great as well. So, David, let's start with you on this one. What do you what do you think about the infrastructure spending? I think we tend to agree with the notion that the infrastructure investment does improve productivity, um, and then it allows the economy to grow at a faster rate without the same degree of inflationary pressure. And so, I think overall, our company would view the the bill as something that would benefit the economy over the long term. And as it relates to Utah, um, you know, the state will be able to access funds for transit, wildfire remediation, uh, water projects. And these are issues that matter to everybody uh, here. And, and so I think that the bill will positively impact Utah and our, competitive, our competitiveness with um, other against other states and our quality of life for a long time. Good. Uh, Robert, any uh, any thoughts on your end? Yeah, so, and I agree that um, in general, infrastructure spending uh, helps grow the economy. Uh, you know, like I mentioned, the, the you know, spending on broadband, uh, spending on connecting uh, isolated communities or improving the connections within our existing communities, uh, improving our water infrastructure, that's going to be so important for Utah. Um, as, as our population grows, which, um, you know, over the last 10 years, we were the fastest growing state in the country, and that growth will continue. Um, we're not, you know, creating any more water. <laughs> so we've got to be better at uh, how we use the water that we have. And so that uh, one of the uh, main focuses should be on uh, improving our water infrastructure and not wasting our water. Um, so Overall, I think infrastructure spending can be positive. Um, I do have a concern about, um, you know, it's, it, to me, it's very similar. Republicans uh, in Congress like to push tax cuts to grow the economy. Democrats gen generally like to push infrastructure to grow the economy. And they're both right, um, but they, all, they both have limits. And so I'm going to criticize both sides. Um, the, the 2017 tax cut bill, which, by the way, was, you know, a trillion dollars as well. Um, I think the, the theory behind it was good, but the application was flawed. Um, they, they passed a, a tax cut bill when we were in a, an expansionary period at kind of at the end of an economic cycle. That's not the time to be providing a, a tax cuts. You should be doing it at the beginning of an economic cycle to help spur growth. That's also, I have a similar fear uh, with the infrastructure bills being proposed. You know, we can have two bills. One of them is traditional infrastructure, and it's a uh, trillion dollars. And then uh, what they what uh, Congress is calling social infrastructure or people infrastructure, um, which is you know kind of outside of the traditional notion. Together, they're four and a half trillion dollars of spending. So over the last year, um, Congress has spent four and a half trillion dollars, and we see what it's done. I do have concern that pumping in another four and a half trillion dollars when we are in an inflationary environment uh, could be a problem. And you know, and I, when I look at Utah specifically, so uh, in Utah last um, legislative session, we passed the largest road bill in our state's history. 
it was a billion dollars. Um, in the in the, the the federal infrastructure bill, Utah is going to get three billion dollars. So just to, you know, it, it, there's going to be a huge infusion of cash coming into the state of Utah. But where do we? How do we spend it? You know, when we don't have enough people as it is, when we don't have enough supplies as it is, um, my fear is that it could drive prices up even more and cause more inflation. So it's not about what we're doing; it's about how and when we're doing it that concerns me. Yeah, one of the one of the one of the questions in the in the Q and A is how do we expect steel prices? When do we expect steel prices to stabilize and come down? If the infrastructure uh, bills come through, which you know nothing, everything you know, no legislation in my mind is ever more than 50-50 likely. But this one, I think, is looks pretty pretty likely um, at the moment. How how? You know, uh, I, I take your point and agree with, with both your points that over the long haul, this kind of spending can be very helpful in uh, making us more efficient pro and productive. In the short term, what, what might it do to, to the cost of steel and lumber and other commodities that are that are used in that infrastructure spending? I, I mean, I think that's a great point, Troy. Um, I think we're in for, for a little while of, of continued inflationary pressure on those prices. I mean, look at what happened with labor even before COVID with the um, construction of the airport and materials. And we saw upward pressure there. And that was not in a pandemic, at least when it started. And so I do think that's a very real issue. And I, I don't know that I'd be certain as to when that will resolve itself, but it, it is going to be uncomfortable, I think, for a while. For a period. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, I, I think the other issue with steel in particular is that it's distorted by tariffs. And so, you know, short term, we'll see um, lots of volatility just around building costs in general. You know, tariffs is a great point. That's something pre-COVID that was the that was the consideration when we had, you know, with the World Trade Center, we had, you know, number of webinars on, on tariffs and, and how they were you know, jacking up prices uh, for goods coming in and, and hurting businesses and hurting consumers. Um, but, you know, maybe the long term, they were better to reset our relationship with China, for example. And, and so with those have kind of gotten, we have, we, we've, I wouldn't say we've forgotten about them, but we haven't talked about them as much. They're still there, right? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I think uh, the 301 uh, tariffs and the steel tariffs, those are still in place. Uh, is that, I think that's right. Is that, anyone have any more recent views on that? Yeah, you're right. Uh, it, it's kind of ironic uh, that, and it was, you know, the Republican president, Donald Trump, that put in trade restrictions and kind of anti-competitive measures. But uh, yeah, I, and I don't see any signs of them going away either. I agree. I know that um, there've been some early discussions uh, this year uh, with, uh, with Catherine Tai and the Chinese uh, the U.S. trade representative of the Chinese, but they have they I don't, I don't yeah from what I've uh, what I've followed it does not look like they're going away anytime soon. That though if it did that could provide perhaps some relief to some extent. Um, uh, China is having its own uh, issues going back to the workforce. Uh, I saw an article this morning in Wall Street Journal that they're having a hard time getting uh, workers to show up at the plants uh, for some of the same reasons that we're talking about. Uh, they don't, you know, people would rather do different types of jobs, declining workforce. Um, so it's a, it's a transitional time right now. And, and COVID has definitely, um, you know, accelerated, accelerated some of those transitions. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's go a little bit more to the, the ivory tower and, um, and talk about, uh, uh, let's see, talk about um uh some of the 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 impacts to from a, from a currency standpoint to uh to, to the us dollar so um especially we talked we talked a little bit about the quantitative easing easing earlier the injection of money into the system um so when we compare the the value of the us dollar against other currencies and um and the interaction of the of, you know even though people aren't traveling as much, obviously trade is as important as ever with the supply chains. What do we, 
you know, do, and this is real. And I know this question is always tough because it's trying to predict what, what's happening in other countries. It's, it's, a, you know, Robert, you can help me out. It's a multivariable counterfactual kind of, kind of situation, but what, uh, I mean, is that something that's on your radar? Is there any, is it something that businesses should, can even really do, can, can even focus on, or is it just too complex um, or other trends that we're seeing that, that people need to be aware of? Yeah, that, I mean, it, it, it has a big impact, but uh, it's really hard to, to kind of gain that or in, uh, plan for that in the future. And there's just been so much uncertainty this year. Um, you know, you look at uh, kind of related to that bond prices. Um, the, the, the bond market is not, and the, I would say the, the bond and also the uh, currency market are not responding the way that they traditionally have uh, to the conditions that we're seeing. And so there's just a high level of uncertainty right now. Um, I think part of that is that while there's, there's uh, you know, over the last uh, year and a half, there's been enormous weakness in the US economy, uh, relative to the rest of the world, it's been extremely strong. And, um, you know, and just even recently, we, we saw big growth in China in their GDP until the last reading. We just got a new reading from China that shows that their economy is starting to slow. And I, I think a big part of that, Troy, is what you just mentioned. They're having labor struggles and, you know, and supply chain struggles. And so there's, uh, there's just a high level of uncertainty. And when there's so much uncertainty in the world, uh, the United States is always the, the, the number one source of, of power and also of stability. And I think that will continue. Um, David, feel free to comment on that. But if not, I, I, I thought I'd have the, the last question sort of to, to go your way and then we'll do some concluding remarks. Is that, does that sound good? Sure, go ahead. Um, so, um, and this is going back to real estate. We did talk about how the construction uh, industry is, you know, has been challenged with with the commodity prices, and that that certainly drives up prices. Another, you know, another huge issue for employers is is that our housing prices. You know, you you can hire, you can try to recruit someone to come into the state to fill a specific skill uh, skill set, but if they can't afford a home, how do you get them in here? Or our students that are graduating from the universities. They, you know, they're they they'd love to stay close to mom and dad and and uh, live here in Utah, but um, but with with you know an entry level position, they can't afford to live here, and I, you know, it's kind of the opposite of what where I, where I used to think of Utah um, as being a place that was you know hard to, you know not affordable. I, I, you know, it's sort of a new a new new term for Utah. Um, so, David, I know you're you're close to close to a lot of this with with the businesses that you work with. Any thoughts on whether whether that's a trend we can see softening or getting better, or if it's going to be a long time, or any thoughts you have on that? Sure, there's no question that this is a tough this is a tough one, and you know, like many issues that we're dealing with, this was a long time in the making. We we simply didn't build enough houses in this country for the decade following the financial crisis, and there were some reasons for that. Um, stringent lending standards, uh, household finances took a beating. And so what we're dealing with now is a lack of housing stock and we have a lot of demand. Um, high construction costs haven't helped either, by the way. So, so price seems to be the mechanism that the market has to, to write that imbalance. And unfortunately, there's probably, I think that there's still more room to run in, in pricing uh, as it relates to housing. Uh, now, commercial has a different set of drivers. Um, but that, that said, I think some of the heat will be taken out of the market as interest rates start to go up. Um, I'd be interested in what Robert thinks in terms of when, when interest rates will start to rise again, when the Fed will adjust their rate. I think our view is that it would be early 2023, so still some time. Um, so what we need to do, I think, it, again, this speaks to kind of the, the policy side. And, and, the, and the good news, I think, is this is a very localized community level decision is that we don't, we shouldn't um, enact uh, as communities, enact policies 
or bureaucratic red tape that will limit the housing supply. And um, this is something that's done at the city level and it has to do with zoning and it has to do with permitting. And if anybody has done business in California, you know that that is a huge, huge barrier to producing homes. The cost is, is exorbitant and the time it takes to actually get developments approved is huge. And so if we're talking specifically about housing pricing and what we can do, I think we need to, to focus really, really hard on making um, houses, uh, getting them approved and built. Robin, I know, I know the legislature passed that mother-in-law apartment bill, which I found super interesting early this year to, to kind of address some of the, some of those issues that David just mentioned. Any other thoughts on that? And we'll, then we'll wind up. Yeah, I think a big part of that is just trying to uh, address some of those local constraints for, you know, equalizing house prices. And, and I, I do struggle with a little bit because this is a nationwide trend. So the, you know, the, the nationwide, um, you know, deficiency in homes uh, is very similar to Utah. So I don't want to be uh, uh, act too aggressively on the local level for a national trend. But you know whatever we can do uh, to you know encourage more affordable housing, uh, to encourage more home ownership, to get uh, more homes built, I think we should be doing. And so, um, so that that's something that we've been working really closely on. Thank you. Good. I think let's let's. Uh, I think we, we've we've uh, used up the better part of an hour. I think we'll let uh, David and then Robert just have any concluding remarks they have. Um, and not you know you don't uh, what, what you know if, whatever you know you don't feel don't feel like you need to but if you have something you'd like to say sort of in, in conclusion that would be great and then Peter will will just hand it back to you uh, to to close us off. Great. Um, well, I, I think as it relates to what companies should do, and the and the, obviously the backgrounds and the industries that are represented on this call are varied, but I think some some parting shots would be making. Um, investments and asset classes that um, are inflation hedges, obviously. And so since, um, since values tend to rise across asset classes during inflationary periods, you know, real estate, for example, is, is one where many investors see as a, as a potential head. Now, that's a little nuanced because, you know, um, there are other issues impacting real estate, such as office occupancy, as everybody knows, and retail occupancy. But the classic example of a, an apartment complex uh, where the landlord is able to reset those rates on an annual basis to stay present with inflation is, is, a, is a great inflation hedge. Um, from a business standpoint, you know, I think what we're seeing a lot of is companies taking supply chain resiliency much more seriously. And so sometimes you hear it as the China plus one strategy where multinationals are looking um, at investing in other countries uh, to provide greater stability in their supply chains. And so that might be Europe. We hear a lot of people looking, a lot of companies looking at Mexico for manufacturing, and then obviously bringing back onshore in the U.S. their manufacturing operations. So those are the things that we're thinking about and seeing a lot of and our clients are, are thinking about. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, uh, and, and I just want to also, uh, you know, thank the World Trade Center and Peter and Troy uh, for uh, hosting this. I think it's really interesting. Um, I guess my uh, a part of my takeaway would be um, what we've learned over the last year and a half is that individuals and businesses need to be flexible um, and need to embrace change. Uh, you know, just if you just think about uh, the, how, how different things have been and how we expect something to happen, then it doesn't. You know, everyone, uh, when the CDC essentially dropped the recommendation for masks, the world, you know, kind of came back and we we're all excited. We thought the pandemic was over and now it's coming back. And, you know, offices are sending people back home that uh, the governor of Hawaii just told tourists not to come. 
um, and you know, and 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 we're seeing these kind of struggles uh, related to uh, the pandemic, uh, the, the breakdown in supply chains. I mean, I, I think we are going to uh, there's going to be a serious questioning of just in time uh, supplies, and uh, and also relying on um, you know foreign sources of of a lot of our uh, basic supplies, and so th so there will be a lot of changes coming on as this. Uh, as the very nature of our of our uh, economy changes, um, one other thing I think is well, and uh, as that relates to what will happen uh, with inflation, I mean, so that that's one of the struggles that people ask me all the time. Well, you know, and this is the big question: is it temporary or is it permanent? And we just don't know, and no one knows. the The Fed is meeting. Well, that's actually the funny thing: the Sp the Fed was supposed to be meeting in Jackson Hole this week, and they just canceled it. Uh, they just went to uh, uh, online instead because of the pandemic. But uh, I'm gonna be watching really closely on Friday uh, when Jerome Powell speaks, and he'll be addressing some of these issues um, about whether uh, that inflation is starting to come down, whether those supply chains are improving, whether we can address the, uh, uh, the labor force issues, but then at the at the back, we've got kind of the surge of the of the de, uh, the Delta variant, and what will that do to consumer demand, and what will that do to consumer confidence, which will then uh, kind of uh, hit our demand side of the equation. And so we just need to make sure that we're flexible, that we're prepared, and that uh, and I you know I'll kind of bring it at, back again. Uh, as tough as things are, the U.S. is still the strongest and the best country in the world, and uh, Utah is the strongest state in the U.S. Thanks, both. Peter, over, over, over to you. Hey, Joy. Uh, thank you for moderating this discussion, and thank you, David and Robert, both for your insightful um, in insights into this matter. And thank you to our listeners for, for tuning in today. We really appreciate it. If you're not already a member or subscribe to our uh, newsletter or, or our email, please sign up. We will have future events like this uh, in the future on various different topics as well. Um, and, and we'll be hosting these hopefully you know, monthly. Um, again, thank you. Thank you all for listening. And thank you, Troy, David, and Robert for, 